Uh, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Trading Academy podcast with your host, Ryan Delaney and Igor Brigado. So here we are. Uh, it's another beautiful day, Igor, on the podcast where we're going to talk about what the heck is going on in coffee. Yeah, sure, Ryan. It's been a, a couple months since we don't do our podcast and some interesting developments have happened in the, in the market. Uh, meanwhile, uh, particularly the bearish downtrend that has been happening over the past three uh, weeks, basically since the beginning of this month. But now the, the market is looking like it's up for COVID. So we all want to, want to know, Ryan, what the heck is going on in coffee? Can you give us a little bit of an overview here? Well, I hope so. I hope that's why we've tuned into the podcast here. Um, and that is a, a good question. So I guess we can uh, let's start with a little overview about what the heck is going on. Now, one thing I'm going to point out here, though, is that we're not giving a, a forecast here. We're not doing a, um, a real detailed analysis um, in these podcasts. We do that for our premium reports. We do that for our premium subscribers. So you can check that out if that's something you're interested in. But instead, what we're going to do in this podcast is just talk about what are the major concepts that are happening right now? What is, what's the big picture um, You know, back and forth between the bulls and the bears and coffee? So... I always like to start out with big picture context. So we are coming from a period of scarcity, right? Uh, we had that uh, uh, frost in 21. Uh, we had all of the drawdown in certified inventory. We had a big bull market that went up, you know, up to 260. And then the more recent past is really this, this bear trend that you were talking about. So for the last year or so, uh, we've really been in a bear market. You know, the, the, the irony perhaps is that the fundamentals are not particularly bearish. It's not like, oh, everything's fine now. They're actually still kind of bullish in a lot of ways, um, but they're better than they were. And that relative difference is really one of the driving factors in, in the bear market. The, the relative difference and also the expectations of the future. Because what's one of the things we always say uh, about the coffee market? Coffee market is forward looking, right? So we're looking forward to the next crop, we're looking forward to the next um, uh, story. Uh, and that's really been, uh, that's really a constant driver uh, to the market. And that's one of the reasons why the coffee market sort of defaults to bearish. It's because we're always looking towards a bigger Brazil crop. And that's really what, what we're looking at now. So, uh, one of the key factors where I said that it's not entirely uh, bearish, right? That there's still a lot of bullishness in the fundamentals. And what I mean by that um, is that if we look at destination market supply, it's still tight, right? And uh, one of the most visible uh, ways of seeing those stocks is with the certified inventory. Now, we could look back even further. I think this is a, a six-month chart you put up here for us, Igor. Um, and if we look back uh, even further, if we look back a year, you'll just see that this downtrend uh, extends even further than that. So we have a very strong downtrend uh, in the certified inventory. If you were to look at a five-year chart of the certified inventory, you're, you would see that we're, we're well on the lows of that five-year period. In fact, we're we're really near the lows of more like a 20 year time frame right so this is very low certified inventory so it's kind of odd that the coffee market has been in a year long bear market when we've been seeing drawing stocks we've been seeing depleting stocks so i think you know the question here is is what the heck is going on right why why are we in a bear market if we have low stocks, if we have tightness? Um, and uh, I think the key to understanding why we are where we are now and where we will go in the future is really lies here in the cert stocks and in, in what's going to happen uh, to the cert stocks. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Uh, indeed, cert stocks are low. And they have been stabilizing for a while, pretty much, if you look at the chart there, since the end of May. And basically, nothing really interesting has been happening since then. We're not going down. We're not going up. So right. the question that I think most of uh, us are asking here in the market today, and especially with the Brazil crop and all upcoming crops in October mm. coming in, is, is there a way that we can uh, predict 
if and when search stocks can uh, rebuild? Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's exactly what what we're looking at now, which is okay. What's going to happen in the future? How can we predict what's going to happen with certified inventory? Um, and really, and, and will we will we see that replenish? Will we see growth in the certified inventory? Um, and I think the answer to that really lies in this concept of tenderable parity. So uh, let's take a step back here before we talk about tenderable parity and just talk about what the cert stocks mean for a second. Now, the certified inventory uh, for any commodity market, but but this is certainly true for coffee, is what keeps the price of that futures market real. And when I say real, what I mean is that the price of futures has a correlation with the price of physical coffee, right? If they didn't match, then there'd be no point in having that futures market. I mean, why would we even say that it's the price of coffee, right? We just say it's the price of this obscure financial instrument. Uh, so the reason that we say that this is a coffee futures market is because the price of that future, that futures contract matches the price of physical coffee. And the way that those prices match is through certified inventory. So certified inventory means that it's actual physical lots of coffee that has been certified, it's been inspected, and it's been approved by the exchange, by the uh, ICE exchange, to be uh, fungible, to be transferable for a futures contract, okay? So if you buy a futures contract on the exchange, then at the end of the life of that futures contract, you can hold on to your long future and receive physical coffee. You'll receive that certified coffee. And on the other side, if you sell a futures contract, you receive some money in your account and you can wait till the end of that future uh, to expire and you can deliver certified coffee uh, against that future. So because you can change, you can exchange your future for that certified inventory, that means there is an arbitrage opportunity, which means that the, the price of that future will never deviate very much from the price of the physical coffee. Why? Because if your physical coffee was very cheap, then you could sell futures and deliver that cheap certified coffee uh, and make a profit. If your physical coffee was very expensive, then you could buy futures and take delivery of that certified coffee. And that's exactly what happened is that physical coffee was very expensive. And because it was expensive, roasters, traders, consumers were buying futures and taking that certified inventory because it was cheaper than actually buying new coffee. And because of that, we had this drawdown in certified inventory. Now, to your point, the question is, how do we tell what's going to happen in, in the future? Uh, and that is where tenderable parity comes in, right? So I kind of alluded to how we can uh, predict that change a little bit, right? Where I said that if the price of physical coffee is very cheap, then people will want to certify that coffee. If the price of physical coffee is very expensive, then they'll want to consume that certified inventory, all right? Are you with me so far? Is this making sense, Igor? Yes, that's making sense. Cool. All right. Uh, so... Let's look at uh, how we actually do that calculation. So there's a there's a, a calculation that is standard throughout the industry, uh, and that's called tenderable parity. Now the words tenderable parity literally mean the break even price at which you can sell coffee, right? So you can tender your coffee. So it's the break even price to sell coffee to the exchange. All right. Now, this is a key concept in any commodity market, um, and it, any sophisticated trader knows about tenderable parity, and they know how to calculate it. Now, it's the math is relatively simple. The challenge is finding all of the different prices to plug into your, your formula here. But essentially, what you're doing is you're saying, what is the differential price? What is the purchase price of physical coffee? What is the price to uh, ship that coffee to an exchange approved warehouse? Um, and what is the price to get that certified uh, by the exchange? 
all of the sampling, the handling, the fees, uh, you know, tariffs, all of that stuff. You take all of those prices together, you add all of them up. And if that equals uh, zero, then that's parity, okay? So, and if it's uh, um, more expensive, then it's a loss, right? And if it's less expensive, then that's a profit opportunity. So maybe that sounds all very kind of abstract if you're not looking at the slide here. So let's let's use an example to, to try to make this a little more clear. So if you buy a Colombian coffee and you wanna sell that to the exchange, here's how you look at the math. The exchange recognizes that Colombia is a premium quality versus other coffee qualities. So you actually get a bonus. You get a, a four cent bonus to deliver Colombian coffee. So whatever your purchase price of Colombians are, let's say it's 10 cents, right? For a, a quality that is tenderable to exchange uh, and it costs you 10 cents over the market to buy that Colombian coffee. Now we take into account that premium that the exchange uh, gives you, and which is four cents. So it costs you 10 cents to buy the coffee, but you get four cents back. So your real cost is only six cents at that point, okay? But now we have other costs to add in. We have the freight cost, which is a seven cents. So seven plus uh, six is 13. Then we have the cost of the warehouse. Let's say that's two cents. So 13 plus two would be 15 cents. And then let's say we have uh, logistics and handling costs of a penny, right? Uh, so that would be one plus 15 is 16 cents. So we've taken our total cost, our, our purchase price, which is 10 cents. Uh, we subtract our premium, which is four cents. So now we're down to six cents uh, cost. We add in handling of one cent. So that brings it up to seven. We add in warehouse, that brings it up to nine cents. Uh, we add in freight of seven cents and that brings it up to 16 cents. So in this calculation, it would mean that it would be a 16 cent loss to buy physical coffee and tender it to the exchange, right? Even with that four cent premium. Now, if that's confusing listening to this on the podcast, all you need to know is this, you're gonna add in all of these different prices. And if it equals zero, then it's gonna be break even. And if it equals uh, uh, less than zero, then it's a profit. So let's use another example where um, where maybe it's profitable. Let's say um, a coffee that it goes for, that has no premium or discount. And we can see the, the schedule here. So uh, a Ugandan coffee or a Honduran coffee, those have no premium or discount versus the exchange. So it's uh, the, the, the exchange will not give you any benefit or discount against that. So let's say uh, you can buy uh, Honduran coffee for minus 20 cents for 20 under, right? And we add in uh, seven cents of freight. We add in uh, uh, two cents of uh, um, transportation to the warehouse, one cent of handling, that's minus nine, right? Uh, so 20 minus nine would be 11 cents. So in that case, we would get an 11 cent profit to deliver to the exchange, okay? Now, buying Hondurans, you know, for minus 20, I'm sure a lot of exporters are screaming right now to think of that. Uh, you know, hopefully we don't get to that uh, kind of low prices for the sake of the farmers. Um, and that's maybe an unrealistic price, but but those are just two extremes to show how uh, how that calculation is is done. And there's also there's also a premium or discount uh, based on the port that you're delivering to, uh, but that's not super important. So the key here to bring this back to how we predict certified stocks is we need to predict physical prices, and then we need to see predict all of the freight costs, and then we can calculate uh, whether or not those coffees will be tenable or not. So the question on everyone's mind here now is will Brazilians be tenderable? Uh, and that's uh, that's the, the most likely coffee uh, in the current environment where that tenderable parity could occur. So um, that's actually something that we do a, a full analysis on. We're gonna do a white paper for our, our premium clients uh, this week where we do all of the calculations and we talk about our predictions on when and if uh, and how this can occur. 
Um, but this is that's the the general uh, the general um, concept, and that's how we would go about thinking about the market. Okay, so basically, uh, the tender of parity would be uh, a level in which it's economically interesting to certify coffee. Yeah. Uh, so the exporter, the trade, would rather certify coffee into the exchange, the ice exchange, rather than uh, finding a, a roaster to to sell to on the exactly. open market. Uh, so it's interesting that you mentioned the, uh, and it's it's something that people that are listening on the podcast might not get because it's visual here for us. But it's interesting to note also that uh, you need to select specific qualities. Right. Right. If you if you do this calculation by selecting a quality that's not tender to the exchange, then your math won't work. And I think that one when when you talk about this. The main question that goes to my mind is, is it possible to get new certified coffee even though we are not in tendril parity? Because yeah. if you're looking back at history, uh, for there are some instances in which we, we did got new certified coffee, but thieves were uh, far from tendril parity. So how do we explain that? Right. It, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and it's something that, you know, I, I recently chatted about with some uh, other analysts on this podcast here. Um, and, you know, I've been looking at tenable parity for a long time, um, you know, the last you know dozen years plus that I've been trading coffee uh, and looking at coffee. And it seems like it's kind of rare. It's, it's It seems almost unusual that we actually reach tenable parity. And yet we still get to these uh, points where you get big stock builds, where we get certified uh, stock builds. So why else might we uh, build stock? Um, so before I answer that, I will say that I, some you know I, I asked this question to uh, an analyst friend of mine uh, recently, and they said, "Look, we we think we believe not us, but the, the analyst who I asked this of said we believe that." For the most part, certified stock is only going to build when you, when we've actually reached that tenderable point. Now, I also know many other people uh, in the trade who say that there's actually other reasons too why people would certify coffee. Um, and one of the biggest ones that I hear is financing. So banks love certified coffee because to them it is liquid collateral. OK, so if you are a trade house and you own a bunch of coffee in your warehouse, yes, that coffee is collateral, um, but it's not liquid. Right. You have to find buyers for all of those lots of coffee. However, if it is certified, then in theory, you can just sell all of that immediately on the exchange in a perfectly liquid market uh, and get rid of your coffee. So if you are a creditor, if you're a bank looking to give loans to a trade house and the trade house has certified coffee on their book, then that's attractive. So one of the, the primary reasons um, that I've been given that uh, an exchange that a, a company might have certified coffee, even if it's not uh, at a point where it's tenable parity, uh, is they might certify that coffee to serve as collateral so they can uh, gain financing. So that's that's the the one big reason why uh, we might see builds in certified uh, coffee, even if uh, it's not at tenable parity. Now, the other reason, and this is maybe a little bit more controversial, is that there could be a, an incentive for trade houses to certify coffee to show the market that there is coffee available. In other words, they're trying to influence the market, right? Um, they may not have any intention of actually selling that coffee uh, for the futures, but they want to show that there is a build in certified stocks. So they could, they could in theory, certify a bunch of coffee that they have no intention of, of delivering. Um, or, you know, that maybe they think will be, uh, you know, will make sense at some point, but they're just certifying it in the present. Okay. So this could be coffee that they already own. So, those are the two primary reasons that uh, we might see uh, certified stocks increase, even if we don't actually reach that tenderable parity. Now, uh, I think 
there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about this week. We talked about, you know, what's going to happen with um, uh, certified inventory. Um, but also we have a guest coming on the podcast uh, next week who's going to be, uh, who's a meteorologist. He's going to be talking about uh, some weather events coming up. Uh, and in preparation for that, uh, Igor, you've just done some research on El Nino, right? We're in the middle of an El Nino event now. Um, so how is, uh, in, in preparation for that podcast, what's your understanding of, of what El Nino is and, and how it generally impacts uh, the coffee market? Basically, El Nino is uh, a period in which the ocean, the middle part of the Pacific Ocean, gets mm -hmm. warmer than usual, and that deviates some uh, uh, weather patterns that usually come uh, along with rains away from the East Asia and towards North America. So it results in some uh, uh, rainfall imbalances, mm -hmm. but that's specific to some areas and also specific to uh, how the El Nino event uh, is uh, and we're talking here about if it's a strong event, if it's a mild, or if it's a weak event. So all of these things uh, influence, and it's really hard to talk uh, about that for coffee in a simple way because we got lots of different origins in uh, lots of different places worldwide, and right. they uh, they react in different ways. Okay. So what I what I found in uh, in my research here. Is well, let's, that... uh, if we can if we can stop you for a second here, uh, just to recap what you just said. So basically, we're talking about sea surface temperatures, right? And not only yeah, surface exactly. temperatures, but subsurface temperatures too. And specifically, as you mentioned, this is in the Pacific Ocean, right? So there's a band along the equator of seawater. And my understanding here, based on what you said, is that that seawater... Um, fluctuates in temperature um, and it when it reaches a certain heat a certain uh, high temperature um, then kind of there's sort of a a, a circular flow between the top of the seawater and the bottom of the seawater where it's cold so there's this sort of circular flow and what a lot of people don't know who haven't studied meteorology is that the temperature of the ocean is a big driver in weather patterns all around the world, right? So when we get this El Nino event, um, it's a specific temperature pattern of the seas, right? And that drives all of these other weather events around the world. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And basically uh, that creates different of uh, pressure. So this pressure differential creates uh deviations from the usual weather patterns patterns like the mm -hmm. tropical jet stream and the tropical convergence zone right and uh like i was saying it's uh it's it's uh different origins will react uh, in different ways mm -hmm. and i think the the biggest question people might have is what about brazil right because mm -hmm. it's the the major uh coffee origin and looking back at historical data and also looking at the maps, uh, the meteorologic maps that show uh, El Nino's area of influence, hmm. it doesn't cover uh, specific coffee areas in Brazil. It more, it's more concentrated towards the north of the country and okay. to the extreme south of the country. Uh, so basically, we don't see notable uh, deviations from typical weather in Brazil, but hmm. something interesting to note is that the average temperatures in Brazil tend to increase a bit and this uh, comes as a mitigating factor to, to frost and winter oh, and coincidentally or not we, we we just passed through the pink peak of this winter without frosts or any uh, big frost alerts mm -hmm. in Brazil and uh, now so, yeah so we had no frost this year so it's not you know one to one correlation 100% but it does seem like that during El Nino years, Brazil is a little bit warmer and therefore maybe a little bit less likely to have frosts, right? Which is what we saw this year. Yeah, and I, I'm here in Brazil and I can say that this winter had no <laughs> no cold at all. It, it's just like summer. 
Yeah. So basically, that's it. And uh, looking back at historical data, what becomes clear is that El Nino tends to have more impact on the robust origins, the big oh, okay. ones, uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. Right. And uh, that makes sense because they're more, uh, they're located closer to the El Nino center, which is the, the Pacific. Right. And they're the ones that uh, get less rain when the usual rainfall patterns are deviated to the right because they're on the left. So basically looking back at historical data in this slide here that we have, you can see that the 2006 and the 2015 El Nino events were strong ones. And uh, Vietnam experienced major drops in production during these periods. And uh, that's also true for Indonesia. Indonesia wasn't harmed in 2006, but it was harmed in, in the uh, 1998 El Nino event, which was the most aggressive one by historical standards. Hmm. Uh, so basically these crops, uh, they get less rains. So the dry period can extend and they uh, can have uh, dry weather in blooming in the case of Indonesia or in the later stages of cherry growth in the case of Vietnam. So again, looking back at, histor at historical data, it, what it seems is that we need to have a strong El Nino to see uh, noteworthy deviations from the in the production of, of Indonesia and Vietnam, like big disruptions. Right. And uh, in a, a year like this year, where we, you know, have been um, having robusta deficits and, and high robusta demand, this would be a big, a big deal indeed. Uh, and in our premium reports, we do talk about our predictions for this and what we see um, in the forecasts. Uh, but this is just sort of the, the general overview of what we, we see. And uh, in our podcast next week, when we have our meteorologist on, uh, we'll talk more in detail uh, with him about this um, and uh, and what he's seeing in crops in general. But I think that does it for uh, this uh, this episode of uh, what the heck is going on in coffee. I think we talked a lot about uh, uh, what the heck is going on with uh, the certified inventory situation, the tenable parity, and with this overview of, of El Nino and the risks to the coffee market there. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, unless you've got anything else for us, Igor. I think that's all. I think we basically covered everything we, we wanted to today. Great. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. Feel free to uh, check out our website, uh, coffeetradingacademy.com. Uh, we'd love to have you guys as subscribers. Uh, that is uh, how we uh, earn our living. So yeah, feel free to uh, check that out for a free trial uh, and give us a try. And uh, always uh, reach out if you ever want to chat uh, the market or uh, you're interested in, in learning more about what we do. All right. Thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. Take care. Thanks, guys.